be sent far away to a where the boys looked after, where they protected, where they safe. We let them speak for themselves. If the language they use is strong, remember it took a lot of courage for them to talk about the secret of Castle Hill. Shrewsbury Crown Court, January this year. Mr Justice Fennell arrives at the start of a 14-week trial that was to hear some of the most appalling evidence of systematic child abuse ever to emerge in a British court. The defendant, Ralph Morris. The charges, 16 specimen counts of sexual abuse, buggery and violence against young boys who were pupils at a special boarding school that he owned and ran. The jury were to hear that the abuse carried on undetected for more than four years in one of the forgotten corners of our education system. Ralph Morris's school, Castle Hill, near Ludlow in Shropshire. Opened in 1981, the school began with the highest ideals. Its aim, to provide a caring, therapeutic environment for children who were the casualties of society. Children with behavioural, social and emotional problems. Castle Hill was one of the growing number of privately run schools that cater for children rejected by the mainstream education system. There are 10,000 children in these private special schools in Britain today. Castle Hill took boys from 25 different local educational authorities all over the country. Top customer was the London Borough of Harrow. In eight years, Harrow sent over 30 boys there, among them Paul diagnosed as dyslexic and unable to cope at a normal school. Harrow's answer to Paul's problems, a special boarding school in the country. But first, they had to convince Paul's parents. It was suggested to us that he should go to Castle Hill because he had educational difficulties, learning difficulties. Who suggested that? London Borough of Harrow. We had, um, we had a phone call from the London Borough of Harrow and we were invited to the local civic centre um, with Ralph Morris, the principal, president and Paul. Um, we had an interview with him separately and then Paul had a separate interview with him. And we were invited up there the next day. So Paul and his parents left Harrow on the 140 mile journey to Ludlow in Shropshire. Arriving at Castle Hill School, they were handed this booklet with its message of welcome from Ralph Morris. In friendly style, he outlined the school's caring philosophy. Looking back, everything was over the top, covered in flowers and all the boys had sweets and cigarettes. They were all, they were all allowed to smoke and we had a swimming pool, plenty of grounds for, the, for them to run around in. It really looked and shouted the, the right place. It really did. Everyone seemed like they was having a good time. Everyone was playing pool or kicking the ball around in the field or in the swimming pool, you know, or in the gym playing badminton or whatever, you know. I thought, this looks all right, you know. It looks a bit like a holiday camp, really. Another boy from Harrow, 12-year-old David, disruptive at local schools, so Castle Hill was suggested to his mother, Julie. Like other parents, she was highly impressed by the school. It seemed really good. You know, he was saying about what they do and where they go and, and I was talking to one of the boys there who showed us around and um, he seemed to like it there. I was like the main person who showed visitors around all the time. You know, because, you know, I used to like, he used to tell me what to say to the visitors, how nice the school is. We go on holiday twice a year, tell you what to say. Um, we used to get, like, five pound pocket money when we used to get 50 pence. We used to get flowers from the market, like there was a hundred pounds worth of flowers, loads of flowers, like the best, and put them all around the house. We used to buy comics from a sweet shop. We never was allowed to read them. You only put them out when visitors were about. And Morris himself appeared to be a friendly father figure who seemed to have the knack of getting on with boys like Paul. 
Ralph well, gave me a packet of cigarettes there, and that was the first time I ever really smoked in front of my parents, you know. And I thought, well, man, this guy's all right, you know. He didn't really appeal to be a schoolmaster or even a principal, which is what he was, you know. He, he seemed to me to be more like a mate. But Morris's friendly approach soon changed once the boys had settled in. Twelve-year-old Douglas suffered an asthma attack on his first day there. Morris's treatment was simple. He just dragged me into the office. Just, just kept thumping the table, you know, you know, shouting on me. What did he say? About, about it. What did he say? He said something about, uh, that trick doesn't work, work on me. When I first went to the school, like, I just thought the teacher, and Mr. Morse beat me up. Like, he just chucked me up the stairs, threw me down the stairs, just kept me up the stairs. He just sent me to bed, you know, he just beat me up and just pulled me off and I hit myself on the locker. But I got into the office and when I went in there he punched me and then started kicking me. Then he got a snooker cue out and started hitting me with that then, to my arms and legs and that. And then when I went out, my shoes come off my feet and he started throwing up me, calling me a fucking bastard, all the way to the bedroom. Along with the violent outbursts, Morris ran Castle Hill with strict discipline. Boys had to work their way up a hierarchical system called Joeing. Joeing was supposedly uh, where you'd do jobs for Mr. Morris and you'd be rewarded with either money or cigarettes. And that's what it said in like the little green book. Well, you had the Joes. You had like Morris's top Joe, then Morris's Joe, going down in a line. Then you got to the seniors who were just like kids, the senior group of kids, yeah? Then you had the juniors, and then at the bottom end of the juniors you had the cabbages. There was nothing lower than a cabbage. In reality, joeing was little more than a form of organised bullying. I used to be one of the joes there, and uh, they used to be able to basically do what they like. They were hinted to or sometimes told directly who needs a good hiding, or things like that, and you could get away with it. All the shows there, that mean you used to get perks. You know, it wouldn't come down, it wouldn't go in behaviour or who's the best behaved kid or anything, it would go by the strength. The stronger you were, the higher up on the list you was. I'd be like quite a few kids up there. Never asked why, what the reasons were. But when you're doing it and getting paid for it, you end up doing it for for nothing really. Stephen, he was a coloured kid in that school. He had like quite a severe speech impediment. He was like, you speak of pecking orders, he was the lowest peck. Everybody, anything went wrong, everyone took it out on him. Mr Morris he said, go upstairs and beat Stephen up. We said, what for? He told us the facts, gave us a rundown. Then started sort of winding us all up, getting us into a really vicious mood, then said, go on, upstairs, kill him. Yeah, so we did, went upstairs, gave him a kick in. I feel bad for what, I, for what I've done to him. I've sat there and thought out, calculated tortures for the kid, just for something a day. But that's a mentality that we were all sort of, we all came to know. Morris's top Joe was a boy called Simon feared by every other boy in the school. All of a sudden the door opened and Simon walked in, started hitting me and come up to me. He grabbed me round the throat and hit me. He also had a sock with a couple of hall balls in it and began to hit me over my body. So I curled up into a ball and I heard the door open. I looked and Ralphie was standing at the door watching. When Simon had finished and Simon walked out, Ralph just walked off and shut the door and left us there in the room. I also remember a few days later Simon came in to me and said, look Paul, I'm sorry about the other day but Ralph told me to do it. Ralph had told Simon, Simon to give me a kick in. And I, I honestly, I don't know what it was over on the thing, you know, I just can't remember, it was something silly. And uh, Simon sent one of the lads to come and get, bring me down a boot and when I got down there, he kicked me in the face several times. And I, I remember he made my lip bleed because he kicked me right in the mouth. And uh, I said to him, I said, you wait till Ralph hears about this. He goes, well, Ralph, just laugh at you because he's sitting me up here anyway. 
one time Simon beat the head out of me once. Really bad beating. Like kick foot like I was playing table tennis and that and I kept beating him like I was laughing so I was winning. But then he then he goes to Mr. Morris, takes me to him. Then Mr. Morris says, take him upstairs, do anything you want to him. So he did, he took me upstairs, like pushed me onto my bed to get me down. Like picking me up, chucking him onto his knee and that punching me in the face, everything. Were the staff at Castle Hill aware of this routine bullying? Former teacher, Peter Lockerman. We were aware as a teaching staff that there was bullying going on. Um, particularly with some of the older boys and this was brought up frequently at staff meetings and the, those minutes were then passed on to Ralph and Ralph's attitude was did you see it happen and we didn't and he said well th in that case there's no proof and these boys are staying. He had a lot of power and a lot of say that was through no fault of any of the boys although some of them like, could have stopped it, could have said no I don't want to do this, this is wrong. That's because everyone was very, very much intimidated by Mr Morris. Ralph Morris ran Castle Hill with his wife Barbara as head of care. As the principal and owner, he appeared to have made a great success of his life. Born in 1943 in one of the poorest areas of Liverpool, Morris was taken into care at the age of two. His childhood was spent in Liverpool's Catholic children's homes, like this one, run by the Sisters of Charity. Leaving care at the age of 16, he joined the Catholic Church to become a lay brother. Morris spent most of the next 14 years at this Liverpool monastery, Bishop's Eton, although he never took holy orders. Known as Brother Campion, he became involved in youth work, and ran the local youth club. Then, in 1973, he left the church to become a care officer at the city's Walton Vale Assessment Centre, closed in 1978 after a series of allegations of brutality against the children there. None of the allegations involved Morris. He left Liverpool to work at this Shropshire special school, Nash Court, there he got the idea to set up his own school and in 1981 bought Castle Hill. As the school's principal, Morris enjoyed his newfound status. Not just in the closed world of Castle Hill, but also in the local community of Ludlow. Ralph was a very respected person in Ludlow. The mayor himself was a very good friend of Ralph. Even the police in the town sort of knew him. As, as a, more as a friend, not as just the principal of the school. I used to go down to the pub, down, down to the bridge, and we met like a darts team there, and they were saying how wonderful Mr Moores was, helping the old people out as well. He was just like a king round the like you could eat crap jokes with anybody, everyone knew him, everyone thought he was a great bloke. He'd walk into shops and they'd be having a laugh and people would give him things and, and they'd get everything on the cheap in there. He was a very well-dressed, smart sort of person and really, just in really, general, really respected by everybody. But behind his public face, Morris hid another side to his character that only the boys were to see. Well, I've, as soon as I got there, I heard rumours of him being there being queer. Oh, I didn't believe it at first, you know, the way kids talk and that, I thought it was just general kids having a joke and that. And they, they all of them said to me, oh, there's more to you, there's more than meets the eye at this school, and laughed. And I said to them, what do you mean by that? And they said, oh, you'll find out in time. Well, when I first got there, some of the kids said, oh, be careful, Mr. Morris, he's a bit queer, he'll ask you to tickle his feet and get higher and higher. But I said, yeah, I will, I'll keep them, I'll try them up too long. James was only 12 years old when he was sent to Castle Hill. And then he asked me to start tickling his feet. I thought, it's a bit weird, but 
didn't think much of it because I didn't know what he was trying to get at. So I didn't know much about it at all then. Um, he started to ask me to touch his private parts um, on top of his clothes. And he just said, oh, take on my feet. And he used to say higher, lower. And he used to say to him, um, masturbate him off. But, you know. And then he used to say, oh, I'll, get, I'll give you some money. Oh, you can go home next week. If you're good, if you do it good. You know. One of my friends called me down to what we call the boot room where our shoes are all laid. He said to me, he goes, Paul, he's had me. And I said, yeah, what, what do you mean by that? And he showed me in his hand, he had 20 Bensons, which is strange because we were only on four a day. And he said, Ralph, he's just sexually assaulted me. And uh, he was shaking and he was really sort of pale and really sort of scared. And I was like, ah, you're joking, this sort of thing. And he says, no, I'm, I'm serious, I'm, I'm really serious. Even on their seaside holidays to Butlins, the Castle Hill boys could not escape the attentions of Morris. Every time he used to go to Butlins, he always used to take you into the chalet. So, you know, oh, I'll put some money, I'll give you some money, extra money for you, spend the money. Just ruin my holiday, because he used to, like, do it with you every single day. You get him to, like, masturbate him off, take you to the bedroom, give you money, so it just ruined your holiday. And the high point of the Castle Hill school year, a trip to Spain, paid for by the education authorities. For Morris, it was another opportunity for abuse. On the way back from Spain, on the coach, you know, I was just sitting in the chair, like, I was sitting here now, and Ralph lied across me. We started uh, undoing my trousers, took my penis out and waked me off, you know. And that's when it first would ever happen to me. And then from there it just started happening more regular. First happened to me was when uh, we was in Spain. But after we had the team that we were sitting there talking, and he asked me if I'd rub some cream into his back, I massaged it. So I wondered why he was asking me, but I didn't really think that much of it. So I was rubbing cream into his shoulders and that, and all down his back. And then uh, after a while of doing that, he asked me if I wanted a massage. He got a lotion, started rubbing my shoulders with it, then my back, then the backs of my legs, then the fronts of my legs. And then he used that as an excuse to start filling up my gonads and like, you know what I mean? and he's feeling up my buttocks and going right into one. I'm standing there and thinking, why is this happening to me? And I'm sort of saying, stop, stop, I want to find my mum, I want to find my mum. He said, no, no, you can find her in three weeks' time or whatever, you know. So I was trapped. I was 12 years old. I knew sort of what was going on, but I wasn't quite sure. He used to tell you, tell you which kids he had, you know, and ask them which kids you've been having, you know, tell it. In terms of try on him. Mr. Morris like, came up, started like going down, wanking me off and that. And I woke up and and he says, Come down here. So I did. And he sat on a chair and made me like tickle his feet, like going up and locking it and like wanking him off and that. But like, he says if you tell anyone I'll kill you like. At night time, Morris would regularly send the staff home and take over their sleeping in duties. It was then that the boys of Castle Hill were most at risk. Mr. Morris was starting to take over the sleeping in routine a bit more, three or four nights out of the week, out of the seven. And uh, he would um, lure a lads into the sleeping in room and, you know, get on with the abuse like. When he used to go up to a sleeping room, he'd say, yeah, bring my tray tea up, grey up, like, you make the nicest cup of tea, you know what I mean? Which was bad news, because I knew afterwards, you know what I mean, I knew why he kept saying to me, you make the nicest cup of tea. During the sexual contact, we would, um, he would be talking to me, 
who'd be en mentioning other boys' names, saying who's the best and what they do, and and uh, and they'd also say, um, <clears throat> oh, if you're good enough and better than the rest, I'll give you a fiver at the weekend. I would be waiting in the bathroom where I would be naked as well, and he would go and get the other lad, and he would start doing it with that lad, and then I would come in after they would start getting going, uh, having sex, and then all three of us would be in the bed like doing it as well. Mr. Morris came up to my room the next morning after everyone else was sort of uh, doing whatever they had to do around the house or at school. And like that was when the sexual abuse really started properly. Uh, he was forcing me to wank him off and he was sort of wanking me off. Uh, he used to use the expression, tiddle me up nicely, like, and used to, used to have all these funny phrases, you know. Uh, this sort of thing went on all the time. Almost every day I was there. For the whole time I was there, after those first two weeks. Was it just masturbation or anything else? No, it went further than that, but I don't really want to go into that. Yeah. Did, I mean, he, did he actually do buggery on you? Yeah. Yeah. So, he kept massaging me top of my legs and that. I could feel him on but my legs and that, and I could feel him on my back. As he, as he sat astride me. But I could feel his penis and that, which I thought was bad news. As I say, it's one of them things where you can't move, I mean, and there's no one in the room. And this room's like away from all the other kids' rooms and that. So what can you do when you're like 14, you know what I mean? I know people can say, oh, well, I wouldn't let it happen to me, but it's a different story, you know what I mean? So, it, it got off me, and uh, I didn't want to turn around. I just didn't want to turn around. once and I found it so excruciatingly painful um, I just didn't want it happening to me again so I said no that's it I'm not having this it's more or less like someone sticking a knife in you um, it's very uncomfortable um, I didn't bleed which was lucky um, but I was pretty uncomfortable for the next three or four days. Afterwards, it's like every time I went to the toilet, it felt as if I was shitting fire. It felt as if all my guts and all my entrails were coming out. I couldn't walk properly. There was, well, I was, my ass was bleeding every time I went for a shit. I was, it was just 
extreme pain. And I, I knew it was happening to other kids there afterwards, you know what I mean? But I just didn't, I didn't want to go up to them and say, is this happening to you? Because I was bullying them like a month, two months earlier. You know what I mean? And it was probably down to me that they gave in. I went back upstairs and I just lay in my bed for the rest of the day, crying my eyes out. All I wanted to do then was go home. That's all I wanted to do for the rest of the two and a half, three years. I just wanted to go home. find the best way to unleash it. Excuse me. <coughs> How's it? Sometimes photocopiers really crease me up. That's why Canon have made theirs simple enough to use standing on your head. <laughs> Just like this. So don't get a headache. Oh. Get a Canon. On paper. If anyone can, Canon can. Whisk liquid now comes in a handy carton pack. Your colors won't go flat. But the pack will. Changing your appearance can be done in just a sec. Be instantly much slimmer, bigger, even change your sex. But you can't make real coffee in an instant yet. Real coffee takes a little bit longer. John, these energy costs, mm, we can reduce those. And our rate of production? Meeting, 10 o'clock. Personnel. Yes, air conditioning. Right, see me at 10. Specially designed target could solve that. But what about installation and maintenance? Leader feasibility study. 10 o'clock, chaps. What we need is a financial package tailored. We can cover that at 10, Ron. Right, there's only one thing on the agenda today. The solution to our problems. Put it to work for you. Resource. The service from British Gas that benefits industry and commerce in so many ways. Put it to work for you. and we absolutely love the after Distra story. Mm -hmm. I think we should be able to fit it in this week. It's just a matter of moving the Jim Connor over slightly. Yes, bye-bye. Where's Tom? Um... Thank you. How can I run a newspaper like this? Report a rap by boss, admits checking instant savings account balance at Lloyd's Bank, apologises profusely. You? A saver? Interest escalates as cash quits current account the savings account. Bank issues frequent statements. In fact, I'm ready to go to Lloyd's Bank and start talking first-time buyer mortgages. Stop talking. Start writing. Right. Ask about the range of savings accounts at Lloyd's Bank. For eight years, Ralph Morris was free to rape, abuse and bully the boys in his care. His system ensured that any boy who complained would not be listened to. I think it's just, they dared and they didn't know who to turn to, who they could trust sort of thing. That's, that's my sort of thoughts, that they, they, they couldn't trust anybody 
like when at home they've had the problems, then they're the same problems. It's just, you, you could tell little kids, the younger boys just couldn't really, they just, they were scared of everybody. I mean, obviously they can't complain within the institution because Morris ran the place and it, the complaint would go to him. But they can't go back to the, the, their parents, the social worker, who? They, they were the people that sent them there. And the second reason they don't complain is what's going to happen when they do complain? I mean, supposing they're not believed, then they're going to be in that place with the added problem of, of recriminations from, from Morris. I, I'm not sure I would have complained if I'd been there. You'd want to tell someone, but you'd tell, you could tell them, but they wouldn't believe it. They'd just laugh in your face. So really, it was a waste of time. You couldn't really tell no one. You could tell your parents, and they'd just laugh at you. Because I'd think he's so great, because he'd put on an act while your parents were there, really. He'd be so nice and polite to you. Wouldn't shelter you or nothing. But supposing a boy's parents did take his complaint seriously, what could they do to get their child out of a school like Castle Hill? If the child's in care, no, the parent can't do anything about it, except kick up a fuss. If the child has what's called a statement of special educational needs, it's a formal identification of special needs, then again the parent has no right to remove the child from such a school. It's hard to explain, but Morris had more hold over our lives at school, at home, the lot. He had us right where he wanted us, under his thumb. He was a very, very convincing man. But even Morris couldn't prevent some complaints from eventually reaching the outside world. As early as Christmas 1987, Douglas began to tell his mother about some of his experiences at the school. I asked him a few questions and I thought that it was going to be a case of boys will be boys. But it was that the principal had touched him. And at that stage that was as much as I could get out of Douglas. Um, about six or seven hours later I went to the police to report it and the following day Douglas and I went to Bridgewater Place Police Station to give statements, both of us, and during the course of nearly a whole day at the police station it came out that Douglas had been sexually assaulted. How did you feel about that day all the time? Scared, but he, he told me if I said anything that he'd stop me coming home. Did you want to tell anybody about it? Did you want to complain? Yeah. How old were you? Twelve. There had been oral sex performed by both Douglas and Mr. Morris. Um, he had actually committed buggery on Douglas. Um, and various other things. And as a result of us giving statements to the police, Douglas was examined by a police surgeon and two days later he was examined by a paediatrician and he had to have an AIDS test. It was in the hands of the police up in Ludlow. And then eventually it came back to us that Douglas wasn't believed, that there were discrepancies in his statement. And then everything went quiet, it was just dropped. Then four months after Douglas's unsuccessful complaint, Paul made similar allegations on a visit home. It was a uh, one weekend. And I got really drunk around my girlfriend's house, you know. And I just thought, fucking hell, man, I can't handle this no more, you know what I mean? But it was really doing my head in. So, I told my parents, didn't I? Paul came straight in. He said, I, I know, I know you want to talk to me. And I asked Paul, you know, what had actually been going on? And he said that, um, I can't go on. No, I just can't. And he said, you know, things were going on that we didn't know anything about. You know, we couldn't believe it. You know, we just couldn't believe what was actually going on there. Well, Paul was, was talking about mutual masturbation, oral sex, and pure brutality and humiliation. Once again, the Ludlow police were asked to investigate. Paul made a detailed statement to them. So then after I made that statement, that police officer went round the school with Mr. Duggan present and questioned every boy at the school. And of course they ain't going to say nothing, are they? Not while they're at the school. What I actually told them was Morris is a lovely man and this is the best school I've ever been to. The same as like K 
countless other brainwashed, misled little petrified boys and were telling them, you know. During the police inquiries, Morris agreed to stay at his house in Ludlow, but even that didn't keep him from his victims. Abused me all the time, you know, even while the even while the thing was like the inquiry was going on, the first inquiry, he used to go down to his house and he had like um his study up, up in the loft. And he used to like take him in the bathroom in his actually own house. Then, three months later, three boys ran away, only to be picked up by the police. One of those boys was Jason. On the way back in the car, we told the police what had been happening to us at the school. Like, we made their statements. And then I was on the way home, and my mum got me to change my mum just changed my mind for me. And I withdrew my statement. Then. Why was it that the local police failed to believe successive boys' allegations? Superintendent John McCammond. These complaints, standing on their own, are very difficult to prove. Um, and there simply was no corroboration to the allegations as they were made. And the people who were capable of corroborating those original complaints didn't do so. They simply, in fact, they contradicted what the boys were saying. So it was difficult to, to get the evidence for a prosecution. Having said that, um, there were mistakes made. The boys who could have given that kind of corroboration were interviewed in the wrong place. They were interviewed at the school. They were interviewed in the presence of people from the school or under the control of people from the school. It's, it's completely the wrong environment. But in December 1988, a fourth boy complained to a solicitor. This time, the allegations were finally taken seriously by both authorities and parents. One of the boys um, had left, was leaving the school anyway, and his mum got on the phone to me, and uh, she said, just get David out of that school because it's true, my son has just broken down and confessed to everything that was been going on. Anyway, he came home, he was only indoors for five minutes, and I took him in his bedroom and I said, now David, tell me if anything's happened to you. And he just comes straight out with it. Um, but he had to um, do things to Miss Morris, like suck his willy, wank him off, Morris wanked him off. He also had buggery done to him by another boy, twice. I think he thought we'd get away with it for a lot longer. Because a lot of people didn't say nothing. It took someone with a little bottle to say something about it. Because I didn't say nothing about it. Ralph Morris was arrested and charged. The police investigation that followed uncovered the full picture of Morris's eight-year reign of abuse. Leading the investigation, Detective Superintendent John McCammond. I've never come across a case like this before personally, and I don't know anybody who has. Uh, we've had institution, cases of institutional abuse reported before, but never on this scale. I'd, I've never heard of a case like it. We actually interviewed 106 boys, of whom 39 alleged sexual abuse. Uh, and it, it took a long time. My officers were, uh, were carpet-bagging all over the south of England, and uh, so in the terms of resources, both for the force and for the Shropshire Social Services, it was quite a large inquiry. How he got away with it and how we didn't know about it, um, presumably come down to his question of his controlling the place and the hold that he had over these boys. Um, sexual abuse is something that children are loath to discuss anyway. Um, but his control was such that, that they, they would, wouldn't talk to anyone. Well, he got away with it. I mean, it's a cl almost a classic management technique, the old carrot and the stick. He gave boys the reward. He, he, he enticed them into his, his net, and once they were in there, he couldn't get out. And if they did try to get out, he used violence to keep them in. And they were terrified of if they didn't conform to what he wanted them to do, then the other boys, the older boys, um, beat them up, effectively. Um, what he did was he... He designed and engineered a culture of evil at that school, in a way. It was, it was quite incredible. He's a very, very good con man. A real con man. I mean, whether he's, he's conned the borough of Harrow as well, I don't know. But, uh, I mean, people who are supposed to be in the job where they know what they're doing, a hell of a lot seems to have gone wrong.
We wanted to ask the London Borough of Harrow what checks they'd made on Castle Hill. They declined to take part in our programme. In charge of Harrow's special school placement at the time was Mary Hayes, now retired. I obviously wasn't careful enough. But I don't know how, what more I could have done. Well, I, I mean, I visited the school on a number of occasions. Um, Harrow educational psychologists visited the school. Obviously, social workers visited the school. Education welfare officers visited the school. The feedback that I got was excellent. I feel sad to feel that I had a part in the placement of these children at this school. Um, I feel very sad for the parents who obviously um, place children there in good faith, sent their children in good faith, the same as I um, recommended the placement. We'd never met Mary Hayes until Castle Hill was on offer to us. And I asked Mary Hayes why she felt it was the right kind of boarding school for our son. And Mary Hayes assured us that she would send her own sons there and she couldn't give a better recommendation than that. Well, um, on my visits to the school, I was obviously very impressed with the staff and the facilities available and the care of the children. And I must say I would have sent any one of my own children there and I feel I couldn't be any fairer than that in sending other people's children. Even if Harrow failed to detect abuse at Castle Hill, anybody could have checked on Morris's background. He was almost illiterate, and the impressive list of qualifications after his name, all but one, were bogus. And his postal degree from an American alternative university, officially unrecognized. Did you check his qualifications? No, I didn't check his qualifications. I didn't honestly feel it was my job to check his qualifications. Um, I would assume that the DES would do this. The DES, the Department of Education and Science, gave Castle Hill its license to operate. Yet they made no checks on Morris's qualifications whatsoever. It was not regarded as significant. They declined to appear in our program but stated, new legislation will reduce the risks of child abuse in schools. That legislation, the Children Act, comes into force later this year, but many of its new safeguards will not apply to schools with more than 50 pupils. So how, then, would the new act deal with a future Ralph Morris? If I was Morris, and looking at the law that was coming, I'd, I'd jack the numbers up to over 50. Then I could register it as an independent school. Over 50 pupils, uh, he can get away with it. So what kind of education did the boys at Castle Hill receive? Me at Castle Hill, I don't know. I learned how to play a good game of football, make a good cup of coffee, and that was about it, you know. Well, I'm trying to get a college at the moment because I want to go back to school because I'm sit around and I know, I'm, well, I don't know. I feel I'm destined for better things, but I'm nowhere, not me. Well, look at me now. I'm, I'm 16 years old. I leave school at Easter. I'm, and my little brother's m more educated than me. My little brother of 12 is more educated than me. I mean... Uh, it's bad, you know? That's all I can say about it. It's just bad. After Morris's arrest, Castle Hill was closed down and changed its name and ownership. The new owners found more disturbing evidence that the Department of Education's inspectors had failed to spot. Uh, when I arrived in the former Castle Hill School, um, the building was totally empty except for the furnishings. Um, for example, in this room, there were eight beds in bunk form, and you can see now there are two. I felt it was totally wrong, and is most unprofessional in its sense of working with these sort of children. And you cannot pile up children of this time. In fact, Morris had piled up 60 boys in a school that was only licensed for 39. Yet the Department of Education's local inspector had made regular visits. Every time like, visitors come, instead of like, you just take like, the beds back down and put them in the bathrooms, behind the bathrooms, in the gym or something like that, 
you know, there's, and it, instead of like having four bedrooms, there's like three beds, so it looked, there was plenty of room in each. We were aware of the fact that beds were taken downstairs when uh, important visitors were coming. We were aware of the fact that children were often sort of sent home on a rotor basis to provide enough beds. Really, that was conning the inspector, wasn't it? Yes, yes, and the authorities. Conning the authorities was not only easy, it was also highly lucrative. Castle Hill's total annual income, nearly one million pounds, all of it taxpayers' money from local authorities who paid up to £20,000 a year per boy. Morris's profit was £366,000. Profits from Castle Hill enabled Morris to buy one of the best houses in Ludlow. Morris also invested in blue-chip shares. Even more of Castle Hill's profits went into tax-free business expansion schemes, ranging from property to food products and new technology. On his arrest, Morris was worth almost half a million pounds. You know, he always used to brag, oh, how much money he's got in a bank. And every time he used to go to the bank, like, he used to take loads of money out. He used to have all these, like, these gold cards. You have to have a, have a lot of money in the bank to have those. I made a lot of money out of it. And I think that's wrong. But I think there was a lot more people making money out of it as well. Everyone earned out there except the kids. When you consider, say, 30 boys at uh, £20,000 a year, that's a, that's a hell of a lot of money. I mean, that's money that could quite easily have been used in setting up a special school within the borough. I mean, that's questions we've asked and never really got any answers to. What do experts think of the policy of sending children away from their home backgrounds to privately run schools like Castle Hill? It's horrific. I mean, it's exactly what those children don't need. They're, they're being trapped in a sort of downward escalator. They find it very, very difficult to get on with people and with life. Graham is still struggling to come to terms with the years of abuse that he suffered at Castle Hill. When I'm 18, 19, I've got absolutely nothing. I can't sink the hold a job. I can't do this. Where am I and what am I doing and where am I going? And you've got a blanket. You blank the whole lot out of your mind. Well, that's what I did. The worst pain for me was my conscience. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? What can I say? And hiding it all, that was worse. All that was was a physical mark, you know what I mean? Like a physical pain. You know what I mean? Things like that don't really bother me so much. It's more than mental pain that hurts me. The psychological pain of past abuse has also affected James, now living alone in the West Country. I've had, had a couple of breakdowns. I've smashed me flat up. I got completely drunk. I got in trouble with the police once. If it hadn't been for Morris, I probably wouldn't be inclined to do it with men. I don't do it now with men. I've had two or three girlfriends, um, but the relationship hasn't been good. Probably because I'm slightly different to what they expect. I do feel rather lonely at times, but luckily I've got a lot to do. Problems with relationships have also affected Paul. I began to believe that I was gay, you know. It, it, it disencouraged me with women, with my girlfriend, you know. And I actually, I, I started to turn, well, not really violent, but verbally violent against my own girlfriend. Which is no longer with me now, due to that. And for Richard, life after Castle Hill has been anything but settled. The last two and a half, three years for me, of my life, I think the only words to sum it up is a fucking big mess. That's all. No other words, just one big mess. They've ruined me, or they've done their best to ruin me. They've done their best to ruin my life. Hopefully I'll be able to get one over on them. Not let them ruin me. How do you see the future? Bleak. Very, very bleak. I don't know what's happening tomorrow, let, let, let alone in two, three years' time.
Well, we've got tremendous admiration for the boys, for the former pupils of Castle Hill School, particularly the ones that have had to give evidence, and more particularly the ones that had the courage to, to complain initially. Um, they seem, I, I hope, that the conviction has helped them to purge from their mind what, what's happened to them. Ralph Morris was convicted on nine charges of buggery, abuse and violence. He was cleared of one indecent assault involving Paul, and six charges, including a case relating to Graham, were left on the file. His sentence, 12 years imprisonment. But his victims may be affected for the rest of their lives. It's affected him very bad. I mean, he's um, more aggressive now than he ever has been. Um, he's only got to look at some, or somebody look at him and he's ready to punch him. I mean, you can't sit and have a really nice conversation with him without him getting really abrupt. I try not to look at my future because every time I do, it don't look good because anyone's got the slightest bit of a folly over me. Oh, I just don't, I don't agree with that, you know. I get in a lot of fights that way, I get in a lot of trouble. More than the sexual abuse, more than the beatings, more than anything, he's guilty of theft. Yeah, because he stole my childhood and he stole every other kid that was in that school. He stole our childhood. My social worker suddenly turned up with this right good idea that a boarding school would do me the world we could and sort me right out. But then, it was it? Alice in Wonderland's story. The boys are suing Ralph Morris for what he did to them. They'll carry the emotional scars for the rest of their lives. And it all happened because the state sent them to Castle Hill School. We'll be back in June. Until then, good night.